the Pistons re-signed Cade Cunningham. JB has been officially introduced as the new head coach of the Pistons. We have a couple of free agency updates and more. All this and more on the next edition of the Palace Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Network. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting night of NBA basketball. The Pistons are digging in. They got the depth. They got the big men. They got the better basketball team. No doubt about it. Pistons need a three, and they have just under three seconds to do it. Here's Chauncey Phillips. Here it is. Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mike Anguilano. Joining me this week is Jasper Apollonia. Jasper, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. It's been an eventful week for the Pistons once again. Uh, we'd love to see it. Uh, <laughs> we got a lot to, call, to to talk about. J.P. Bickerstaff finally had his introductory press conference. Uh, Cade Cunningham is... Well, even if he's not going to be staying in Detroit for the next five years, he's certainly going to be getting paid like he's staying in Detroit for the next five years. A whole lot to talk about, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. A little bit under the weather. I also have some people on my roof rebuilding my chimney. So if something smashes through my ceiling, you'll know that um, that's what caused it. So, Oh, my um, God. It's the Donnie Darko podcast. (laughs) let's, Let's I hate that movie. It's like a cult classic and people love it or hate it. It's like V it's like V for Vendetta where people are like it's so deep and has such great meaning. Both of those movies suck. Um <laughs> to me, sorry. Uh if you if you are offended by my movie takes, then uh just wait I, for the I, basketball I, takes. <laughs> yeah, just just wait uh for like forty minutes of JD Bickerstaff, which people seem to really like. Um so hopefully we'll be able to provide another great podcast experience. We do have a lot to cover. Before we get to it, I want to thank our sponsor this week's show, and that is Bet Online. And Bet Online is your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season, from baseball, golf, soccer, right to all the top fights in UFC, MMA, and boxing. Every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head on over to the online casino and get in on the game of blackjack or poker uh, or unwind with 150 different slots games. Head on over to the website today. To get in on the action and use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, for a 50% free bet credit on your first deposit up to 250 bucks. Again, that's B L E A V for a 50% free bet credit on your first deposit up to 250 bucks. Bet online, the game starts here. I'd like to have our pre show plugs as well. Uh, please subscribe to our newsletter at palacepistons.com. Our Substack is getting regular updates. You'll get a oh, Weekly article, at least from me on Mondays, called The Weekly Drive that uh, sort of surmises the uh, last week's worth of Pistons news and anything that's even slightly related. Um, You'll get a Wednesday article from Aaron. Aaron is out this week, so you didn't get one this week, but you will get one next Wednesday. I'm sure on his favorite time of the year being Summer League. Um, And then every Friday you will get the podcast. Um, So please subscribe to our Substack. You'll get all that and more added your way directly to your email inboxes uh, for instant access. Uh, And we really do appreciate it. And and if you are watching on YouTube, uh, the link to subscribe is in the show notes uh, on the video that you are watching. And we would really appreciate it. Okay, let's get into our topics for today's show. I'm going to start. I'm going to go a little bit out of order to where they chronologically happened. Well, I'm going to start with Cade's extension because I think that's the most important piece of news. Um, Cade Cunningham and the Pistons agreed to a five-year, $224 million extension. It can get up to $269 million. It is a rookie-scale max extension. We've talked previously on the podcast about how we're not sure if Cade was going to accept it or if he was going to be the first uh, rookie to decline the rookie-scale extension uh, and test the waters of free agency. Obviously, he did not do that. That's a lot of money to say no to. Um, Jasper T, was this a sigh of relief? Is this a show of confidence? Is it both? Uh, you know, do you think he's worth a rookie max extension? There was an article, I can't remember from who, that said he's not worth it, but the Pistons had to pay it anyway. You know, what are your thoughts on on Cade signing an extension? And to me, it's a sigh of relief, and, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Yeah, 100%. I mean, to be clear, 
the only way I didn't think Cade Cunningham was going to accept this extension was if the Pistons ran it back. Like like the team from last year, Monty Williams and and you know Troy Weaver. I, I think if I was him, if I was his representation, I'd be like, I, I don't know, buddy. Like I, I don't know. It's a lot of money to turn down, but it's also a lot of money you could be giving up in the future if you're going to be you know labeled in a certain type of way because the organization around you is utter garbage. That obviously seems to be changing, uh, at least from what we've seen this off season. For me, I though I think. It's exactly what should have happened. Like, I know people are always going to argue, well, he hasn't proven it. But frankly, the rookie max extension is rarely about what you've done so far. Very few guys who signed the rookie max extension have won a playoff game. LaMelo Ball did not win a playoff game before he signed his rookie max extension. Anthony Edwards, I I know they made the play in, but like they did not win a playoff series before he signed his rookie max extension. Uh, Guys like Desmond Bain, that's obviously a little different situation, but like the reason he signed it is not because he was leading the team. It's because John Morant was an MVP (laughs) finalist. So I I think when you look at these and you look at the other guys signing their extensions, look, Franz Wagner signed a similar extension. Who would you rather have Franz Wagner or Cade Cunningham? Um, Scotty Barnes signed an extension for more money than Cade Cunningham because he made an all-star yeah. team. That's another one where it's like, maybe some people will disagree with me. I know there's always going to be contrarians. There's always going to be people that don't believe in Cade. Um, but I think when you just look at the numbers, you look at what the rookie max extension is, it's not necessarily a, a free agent max. It's That's for what you've done already. The rookie max is for for what the team believes you are going to do moving forward. And if you're looking at the comments around this organization, if you're looking at where Kate Cunningham is in his development, I mean, 23, seven and a half and four and a half. I just think it's a no brainer move. And I think it's just something that like you have to assume if we put a, a team around this guy, he's going to live up to that extension very quickly. He's he's only paid as like a top 20 player year in, year out. Uh, as of right now, that's going to change, obviously, in the next couple of years. Guys are going to sign free agent deals. So I, I think when you look at like the timeline of his development and where he is right now, um, if he's getting paid like the 25th best player in the league in a year, probably in the 30th best player in the league in, in uh, two years, When you look at that, especially with the cap going up, and I think that that's a small part of it that people don't really realize, the NBA just signed a $72 billion deal, which is an absurd amount of money. And you cannot forget that, I believe it's what, 51% of that goes to the players. So the cap is going up significantly over the next couple of years. Um, I actually think the Cade extension is going to look kind of like a bargain in in a little bit. It's not going to be like a like a Steph signing his extension, you know, opening up room for KD. It's not going to be that much of a bargain. But in a couple of years, I I think that the money that Cade is getting paid is going to be a very, very, very good deal. And I think the Pistons are honestly quite lucky that they were able to lock him in for it this year uh, and not next year or the year after where the cap is presumably going to be going up a lot. Uh, Mike, how how do you feel about it? Are you on the same page as me? I I feel like we probably are, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, we're on the same page. I mean, you have to you have to give him the extension. You have to offer it. Um, he's your foundational building block. All of the moves that have been made this offseason have been around him uh, and sort of making the best use of his current skill set and trying to get the most out of him, which is something that the prior regime just didn't do. Um, so, yeah, I'm on board. The cap is going to go up. The TV deal is going to impact a lot of things that we just don't know of yet. Um, Five-year 224 seems like a lot of money. Scotty Barnes is getting more, and I would rather have Kate Cunningham, if I'm being honest. Um, I I do think of it as more of a, this is a lot of money. I'm not going to say no to it than necessarily a show of confidence. I do, you know, everybody is going to love the picture of shaking hands and say everything's fixed, but... um, at the end of the day, the moves that they made this offseason to make him uh, a better player uh, are going to be seen immediately. And that's ultimately what 
you have to do with Cade at this point. They have basically wasted the first three years of his time in Detroit. He was hurt for most of year two. Um, but now they're making the best of the situation by giving him actual NBA players. Um, I think you have to sign him. I don't, there was no doubt here and I don't have any problem with giving him the money again. It's not my money, uh, but he's one of your foundational building blocks. He's one of the best young players in the league. They had to do it. There was simply no way around it. And is he worth a max? Probably. I mean, he probably is. It's very hard to gauge Kate Cunningham because the team that has been around him has been mostly bad towards unplayable. We were doing a little thought exercise in our group chat of how many players from last year's roster are rosterable in today's NBA. And like 65 to 75% of them were not. Um, the, the the talent that's been on the roster has been uh, very low. And they have upped that a lot with NBA players and Tim Hardaway and Simone Fontecchio, who we're going to talk about later, and Tobias Harris and Malik Beasley and all these other guys that our actual NBA players were starting regular NBA games on much better teams. Um, so to me, it's a bit of a sigh of relief. It is a bit of a show of confidence, but it's a lot of money that I don't think he was really ever going to turn down. Yeah, he would have been silly too, frankly. And uh, I, I just think that this is like kind of a no brainer for me when you just look at like the way the NBA operates, the way the cap is going, um, what you're trying to do with this rebuild. I, I understand it's a rebuild, but like they're trying to do this in a way where they don't have to tear it down to the studs because you already have a lot of high draft picks on this roster. You have talent. You have young talent. The issue has always been maximizing that talent, taking advantage of that talent, putting that talent right. into the best position to succeed. And uh, every every move that's been made this offseason, I, I, maybe you can argue about the Tim Hardaway Jr. thing. I, I know some people are still mad about Quentin Grimes not being on the team. I I personally, like, even when they traded for Quentin Grimes, I was like, cool, I, I like Quentin Grimes, but, like, this is a move that is uh, an upside move. It's not like he's some proven stud. Um, there, there is a reason the Knicks were like, sure, have at it. Yeah, like, and I think it was more indicative of, like, what the trade value of Boyan and Burks was at that point in time, frankly, more than anything else, where you couldn't get anything, you know, you couldn't even get back your own first-round pick from them. You know what I mean? And like, I right. just think for me that that's a top 18 protected or top 14 protected first round pick this year. I, I can't remember what the protections are off the top of my head, but like it wasn't going to be a top five pick. So I just think for me, when I look at it, like that was just, I don't know, not, not that big of a deal. And I think when you look at who else you've brought in this off season, I would be very surprised if the loss of Quentin Grimes is going to be something that in three years you're saying, oh, my God, we could have won a championship. If only we had Quentin Grimes. Like, right. I just don't see it. So, uh, yeah, I, I just think it was a no-brainer, and I have no issues with the deal. None whatsoever. Like, it's no. it's something you had to do. I would have had an issue if they hadn't done it. Right. Uh yeah, if if they didn't do it for some unknown reason, then then yeah, I would have had an issue. Or if they tried to lowball them with something saying, "Hey, you know, you didn't make this team, you didn't make that team, or whatever," then I would have had an issue with it. But Trajan Langdon has the um, ability to do what he needs to do to put together a good team, and Tom Gores is paying for it, so um, I don't have any issue with it. And you know, we're going to jump around a bit because we talked a lot about some of the players uh, that are being put around Cade. And we do have a free agency update since the last time we had this podcast. Uh, Malik Beasley was signed to a one-year, $6 million deal. Simone Fontecchio, two years, 16 mil. That's a bargain of a deal. There were people outraged on Twitter slash X about how good of a deal that was and how the rest of the NBA allowed Detroit to get Fontecchio on such a good deal. And then most recently, Paul Reed. Uh, he has a cap of $7.7 million based on his three-year $24 million contract he signed with the Philadelphia 76ers. He was cut as part of a cap casualty. Um, the Pistons picked him up as another big in their long list of front court players, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, the Pistons have about, and this is per um, spot track, Pistons have about $5 million left in the salary cap. Uh, after the Paul Reed acquisition, they have a couple of cap holds as well. 
So they get like 5.2-ish mil left. Uh, but they get Malik Beasley, who was with the Milwaukee Bucks last year. Fontecchio, of course, they traded for last year. And Paul Reed, who was with the Sixers. Um, Jasper, any thoughts on those signings? Um, Beasley, Fontecchio, Paul Reed, we kind of expected Simone Fontecchio to stay. That's not really a shocker. I think what is a little bit shocking is how good of a deal he's on. Um, but then Beasley, one year, six mil. And then Paul Reed, who we really liked in the group chat as a nice option for backup center. Uh, what are your thoughts on those? I, I think they're all just excellent signings, frankly. Like, do we know if Fontecchio has signed the deal or if he just agreed to the terms? Because if not, they still can go over the cap and they would have, I believe, then like $13, $14 million in cap space to where they could still absorb another contract. Like, you can't forget, this is not a complete roster at the moment. I believe they still have one, maybe two roster spots open at the moment. Um, I mean, we'll see what happens with that. They could just fill it in with end of the bench guys because the rotation looks like it's it's pretty solid right now. It could be a trade of, of you know, one of Ivy or Duran, Stewart, who knows? Like, we've been talking about that. Um, although, I will say J.B. Bickerstaff's comments on Jaden Ivy seems encouraging for him to stay in Detroit. Uh, I just think these are all really good deals. And obviously, Montecchio... To answer yeah. your question, Fontecchio was not officially signed per Pistons PR. So they can still they can still they make could, trades yes. and then sign him to go over the cap. And and Correct. he wouldn't be that much over the cap e- even then. Um so I think and, and to to illuminate the audience, why can the Pistons go over the cap? Yeah, it's because he's a, a restricted free agent. They have his bird rights. Uh, bird Correct. rights basically mean th- this is the same reason why the Pistons, you know, were able to um, spend all that money in 2016. And then they re-signed Andre Drummond to the max contract after the fact. Like he was the last piece of that. They Correct. agreed to the max, but they signed him afterwards. So that's the beautiful thing about bird rights. Uh, the only good thing the Boston Celtics have given us uh, over the years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, manipulating the cap in order to uh, keep their star players. Uh, damn them, damn them all to hell. Uh, but no, I, I think these are all like really good deals. And I know it was weird for me to see pushback on the Malik Beasley thing. I think six million for one year is a great deal for a guy who started 72 of 77 games uh, in the Bucks backcourt last year, um, shot... Oh my God, he shot like what, 41% from three on seven. He was in the three point contest. Yeah, he was good. He was straight up good. And I know a lot of people, he has a reputation of not being good defensively, but I've seen a lot of people that I trust talk about his defense over the year as having improved his activity on that end. And, And I think that's just like a big part. Like I, Simone Fontecchio, when they traded for him, a lot of people were like, oh, well, he's not a good defender. And I think all three of us were like, maybe he's not the best defender, but he works hard on that end and he's smart. And and that just goes like such a long way, even when you maybe don't have the physical tools. Uh, We saw Simone Fontecchio play some great defense at times last year. And I expect largely the same of Malik Beasley, who, because it's a one year deal, um, you know, whether you're trading him to a contender He's going to want to play well in order to get that trade. Or if he's trying to sign a bigger contract next offseason, he's going to want to play well so they can sign that bigger deal next year. So I think for me, like this is just just smart deals around the board. And the B-ball Paul thing, too. Like, I love that, man. Like, Paul Reed's a guy that we've all been talking about. It feels like for years in our group chat about being like, damn, it'd be nice if we could get Paul Reed from the Sixers. Um, and And he's going to immediately solidify that backup center position i think it also opens up and uh, maybe some people aren't going to like this but like you can play stew at the four occasionally now and i think while that's not something we want to see full time it's certainly something that you want to be able to throw out there you want to have as much versatility offensively defensively on your team as possible i think that the the that all these moves, frankly, like open that up for you. You have a lot of guys who can slide between positions and that's just where the game of basketball is these days. Like you need to do, you need to, to, to tailor your lineups based upon uh, what the other team is throwing at you. So I'm very happy with this. I think it's so refreshing 
after years of like, I remember the first time we started being like Troy Weaver might might be a fraud was when they massively over when they overpaid for Kelly Olynyk, and I was just like, why would you do that? You don't need to pay, overpay for Kelly Olynyk. This is not a move you need to do. And now to see on the other end of the spectrum where you're going, damn, I can't believe that guy signed with us for that cheap. Like, that's a great deal. That's a great deal. Um, the, the years make sense. The players make sense. The fit makes sense. It's It just feels like night and day. So I'm very happy about it. Yeah, I think these are all fine moves. And um, I don't know why there's pushback on Beasley. Uh, other than the fact that he, you know, there's a reason that the Bucks didn't want him back, and people look at that and say, "Well, he he can't possibly be good." Teams are in individual situations where they have to monitor their own cap space, they have to monitor their own vibes in the locker room. Maybe Malik Beasley did not mesh uh, with the locker room. Maybe they have some other move plan. The Bucks are one of those weird teams that the East has kind of forgotten about with the Knicks getting Mikhail Bridges and the Celtics winning a championship and. Um, the Sixers getting Paul George, all of a sudden the Bucks are like the fourth or fifth team in the East right now. Um, who's to say what the situation is? Beasley may not have wanted to be there. Um, so I have no problem with the Pistons signing what would have been the best three-point shooter on the team last season. I don't have an issue with that. Uh, Paul Reed, same deal. Yes, he's a backup center. He's infinitely better than James Wiseman. He shot like 36% from deep. He's an actual stretch big that they need. Um, and I, I don't have any issue with that. Again, you have the cap space to do it. You have these trade exceptions to fit players in. I have no issue with Paul Reed. I have no issue with Malik Beasley. Simone Fontecchio signing two years, 16 mil at least reportedly, uh, is a great deal. Again, I can't believe the Pistons got him for that cheap. Uh, he is a guy that f- slots so easily with almost every contending team. Almost every contending team could have used a Simone Fontecchio type of guy a stretch big is so valuable you just saw the boston celtics win with chris Stapps porzingis being a stretch big in addition to al horford who's also a stretch big so these are all good moves you have a log jam in the front court though isaiah stewart jalen duran tobias harris Vontecchio. if you try to slide anybody down to the three you're going to run into the asar thompson ron holland group something is going to have to give the dam is going to break in some way whatever it may be um what are your thoughts on the front court now? By adding Reed and keeping Fontecchio, you have a lot of guys now who are going to need playing time, and there's not a real clear way to divvy it up as it currently stands. I I don't think that having too many guys who can slot in three, four is ever a real problem. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> I'd rather have that problem than the problem the Pistons have had for the last decade plus, which is, oh, my God, who's going to play small forward? Um no, I, I definitely think it can work. And to me, it just more screams that, like, they're going to bring Ron Holland along slowly. And I'm fine with that. Like, based on the contracts that you've given out, based on the age of the players that are ahead of him right now, I am okay with Ron Holland being brought along a little more slowly, not just throwing him right into the fire. Uh, perhaps he plays some G League minutes this year. And I know people are going to look at that from a number five overall pick and go, oh, no. But, like, that's not the worst thing in the world when you think about, you know, how much you would have had to have played him last year. So for me, I, I think it's not really much of an issue. I, like I said, I I still think like you're not you're not moving Paul Reed or Jalen Duran away from the center position. I think it gives you the opportunity to to play with minutes. And more importantly, and this is something we've seen recently is when injuries do inevitably occur um you have to have people that can play like we were in the middle of october last year and going like who the hell is going to start tonight like who are they going to throw out there because the pistons simply did not have any depth so for me perhaps it is the sign of a trade coming perhaps you're right on that but like to me I i look at it I think it's more of just like a, we need depth. We need depth. Injuries are going to happen. Trades are most likely going to happen this year. Like I would not be surprised to see Malik Beasley be moved at the deadline or, or somebody else, maybe even Paul Reed, who knows. Um, And I wouldn't be surprised to see somebody else get moved before the season even starts. So 
I have no issues here. I, I'm not worried about it. I'm not overthinking it. I'm totally fine with having um, an excess of depth in your front court right now because God knows we saw what the opposite looked like last year. Yeah, we don't have to watch Isaiah Livers play anymore. So that's a big step in the right direction already. Um, they don't have to make a trade. Uh, I do think that Isaiah Stewart has gotten some interest around the league. The New Orleans Pelicans were reportedly interested. The Oklahoma City Thunder were also interested. That was prior to getting Isaiah Hartenstein. So that's probably dissipated. But there's obviously value around the league in a guy like Stewart. And it doesn't have to be now. You're right. It it doesn't have to be before the season. It could be closer to the deadline. Um, There's just a glut of guys that Pistons could perhaps get some value out of Uh, They might get more value out of them later. Uh, We'll just have to wait and see. I do think they will take Holland pretty slowly. He's one of three players that I'm interested in on the summer league team as well. Uh, This was a weak draft. I wouldn't be surprised if he is low in the pecking order for playing time. So the people that are concerned about the glut, I think you're not going to have an issue. Um, Holland's not going to be getting regular minutes every single night. There's a lot of guys who are above him in the pecking order. Tim Hardaway Jr., who we didn't even really talk about much, that's a guy that brings shooting once again um, to the roster. And Asar Thompson, who is your kind of defensive stalwart right now that is going to see a lot of court time as well. So, um, But overall, these moves make a lot of sense. They're not nonsensical moves like extending Marvin Bagley for some ungodly reason. There, you know, There is method to the madness. Is there a roster glut? There kind of is, but that's okay. Again, your depth was really bad last year, and you're sort of insulating uh, not only yourself from that problem, but you're insulating the young guys from having to take on an enormous burden when those injuries inevitably do happen. Um, And that's really important. We've just kind of become accustomed to it as Pistons fans of being like, oh, yeah, it's Kate Cunningham and Marcus Sasser figuring it out in the backcourt. And, you know, they get blown out by San Antonio by 30 or whatever. You know, you're not going to have that problem anymore. You're going to have veterans around to sort of keep the young guys in check. And I talked about it on the last pod. J.B. Bickerstaff's going to do that. He's going to do that with his vets, give them playing time if the young guys aren't doing well. He did that with Ricky Rubio constantly. Um, so by having vets, you're adding a layer of protection in like a in a way that you weren't able to the last couple of years because there were just so many injuries. Yeah, and I think this is probably the right time for us to talk about J.P. Bickerstaff. He just had his introductory press conference yesterday. Um, Another one of those situations where, man, it just felt like night and day from last year uh, with the introduction of of Monty Williams. And you know, like anyone who listens to this podcast regularly knows, we were so excited for Monty Williams when they made the hiring. And then after that first press conference and after some of his first comments, we were like, uh, okay. Um, hmm, I'm a little worried about this now. And he said the word money too much. <laughs> yeah, he talked about the Well, it's funny because the first two things he said was like, you know, the, the players or the situation and the money. And boy, let me tell you about the money, guys. Like, that was, they're like, okay. And then he's talking about like defensive field goal percentage. You're like, all right. Uh, he's got the pedigree. <laughs> like, this is like kind of an opposite situation where you immediately have JB Bickerstaff talking about the right things, the things that I think we as Pistons fans all want to hear. Talking about, hey, we're not going to talk about wins and losses, but this team, you're going to see an identity here. And this is the identity we're going to have. We're going to hustle. We're going to work. We're going to improve throughout the year. We're not going to skip any steps. Um, Shoot, even just talk about the simplest things of all, something that we were clamoring for all last year, hey, I'm going to stagger Cade and Jaden Ivey's minutes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, my God. I didn't even know that was possible. Is that legal? Can you do that? Can you stagger two of your best players' minutes? Um, Yeah, it was just very, very, very positive press conference. It was all the stuff you want to hear. Him talking about how, you know, he's he's on the same page with Trajan Langdon. Um, How he feels like there is a foundation here that he can build upon, that he can work with, that everybody's on the same page. And 
after last year's debacle, I mean, you had, you know, Tom Gorris coming in and being like, Hey, these are, this is what we're going to do with our roster lineups. Like you need to play Jaden Ivy over Killian Hayes. Like, I don't think we're going to be seeing that this year. I, God help me if we do see that. No. This year. But no, we're not going to. And just Bickerstaff, like, talking about how he's interested in the defense and how they were a top seven offensive unit a couple of years ago and they switched that over a little bit. This is how we did it. Just seems like a guy, not with his finger on the pulse, a guy who has a, a, a friggin' pulse. Like, and that that alone just seems like such a massive upgrade to me. So I was very, very happy um, with what I heard. Uh, Mike, does this like gel with what you know about JB as a coach? Like, was this what you expected to hear? Was this better, worse than what you were expecting? It's about what I had expected. Um, he talked about his experience in doing this similar thing with the Cavs, and he did. Um, once again, as I said last week, the Cavs had two guards that they had to figure out how to stagger. First, it was Garland and Colin Sexton, then it was Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland, and he did figure out a way to stagger them to the point where it was effective. Um, So it was nice to hear about that. He talked about success next year being not wins and losses. It's very, very Ty Lue-esque. After LeBron left, Ty Lue called it wins and lessons. That is very much a Ty Lue type of deal where he's going to measure success as improvement. And improvement is a catch-all term. It's also subjective to I mean, improvement for the Pistons is 25 wins. And some people may think, oh, God, that sucks. Well, 14 is a lot worse. So improvement is going to be the name of the game. Um, I thought it was a good a good press conference overall. He said the right things. Um, he, and based on my experience with him, he's never been a guy that has, you know, shied away from talking about how things are. Um, he's always been a very good speaker. Uh, he's always been great with the media as well. Um, so it was as expected. Um, there is some whiplash from last year cause we did have a good feeling after Monty was hired a little bit less so after the first press conference, but JB was all business. Um, Langdon seems to have a lot of faith in him, which I did, you know, being a Cavaliers fan as well, I, I had faith in JB also. Um, again, he just ran out of time in Cleveland. So this seems like a logical place for him to sort of pick up his career and do what he did with Cleveland in a very similar situation. They were in the dumps. They were coming off the John Beeline disaster where he said thugs, slugs, apparently. Um, he's coming in and, and picking up a, a messy situation, that, and, and he has experience in cleaning it up with a bunch of young guys who are figuring out their way in the league. Whether Ivy is on the roster still, whether Jalen Duran is on the roster still, um, there, there is a lot of good that JB can bring. So I was very happy with his press conference. I think he's going to be a much better coach than Monty Williams was. And you talk about having a pulse. JB knows where the pulse is, which is also very helpful. He knows where to look. You know, he can go to the vets in the locker room and sort of establish uh, relationships with them. He did a very good job of, of doing that in Cleveland. He used Kevin Love a ton uh, when he was there as the vet in the locker room. He used Ricky Rubio a ton as the vet in the locker room to sort of stabilize things. And he had no no problem going to them in crunch time. Uh, so it was a good press conference. I'm interested to see what people think in the comments about JB uh, and if there's any other questions that people have. Um, I know he's new to Pistons fans, but he is not new to me after five years of covering the Cavs. <laughs> Can't wait I have to do this again. This is unreal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's a very good guy. He's a very good coach. Um, I think he'll do really well with uh, the Pistons. Yeah, we'll see what it looks like in a few years. But I think as of right now, he's a he's a coach that just makes sense for where this team is right. at. And I loved hearing him talk about you know, the acquisitions of Tobias Harris and Tim Hardaway Jr. as being not just for on the court, but in the locker room as well. Guys who are going to, who are professionals, who are going to be able to show this team, these young players, what it means to be an NBA player and what it means to improve and what it means to to put yourself into a position to be a, a playoff team. I, I just thought that that was very, uh, very indicative of what the Pistons need and where JV is going to have them. And it's something that we have been clamoring for. Like none of us are expecting 
the playoffs this year. But I think what we are expecting is genuine improvement and genuine professionalism and just a return to something that looks like Detroit basketball. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I got away from this press conference is he understands what what this team means to the city, what the identity is. And I think that he and Trajan Langdon have both done a very good job of putting this organization on the right path back to that so far. Like they've done all the small things, all the beginning steps right as far as we can see. So I'm very, very happy to see it. And uh, I'm very encouraged. I will say it will be interesting if the Pistons win 28 games or if they win 34 games this year, I believe JB Bickerstaff, if they win 34 games, he'll be simultaneously. I believe the first coach to ever double a team's win total um, from the previous year, and also the first head coach to win 20 more games from the year previously uh, for two different franchises. So J.B. Bickerstaff, please make history this year. <laughs> not not the kind of history that Monty Williams made. <laughs> the better no, kind. I don't know. And he did that with defense, with the Cavaliers. He did that with defense. That was not a team that was an offensive juggernaut. They didn't have Donovan Mitchell yet when they doubled their win total. They had Darius Garland and Ricky Rubio in the backcourt. They had Colin Sexton and Jetty Osman. You know, he didn't do it with the the stars like Donovan Mitchell. He didn't do that with a fully realized Darius Garland. Um, so I was also very encouraged. Um, like I said, it'll be very interesting to see how this team looks next year under different leadership on the sidelines. But Jasper, that's that's all that we have on our list of topics. Is there anything else that you want to hit on? Um, I mean, I think the second you know the Pistons offseason is over is the second that Fontecchio officially signs that deal. The fact that he right. hasn't makes me think there probably is still one, maybe even more moves in store. I don't think the Pistons are going to pull a Troy Weaver and uh, trade for Joe Harris and say, my job here is done. done. So yeah. I think I think we are probably going to be coming back on this podcast next week. And I think we will still have something else to talk about. Uh, inshallah. That's that's my hope. Um, so, yeah, that's it for yeah, me. We'll have we'll have Aaron to talk about summer league. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Pistons, favorite time Pistons of the year. trade for Kawhi Leonard. Aaron says that's next week. We're talking summer league, baby. <laughs> we're, we're talking summer. We're talking Marcus Sasser. Um I do want to give our post show plugs here before we wrap up this podcast. Again, this podcast is available on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast, you should follow us on social media at TikTok, palace of Pistons uh, on X palace of Pistons, Instagram palace of Pistons and our Facebook page palace of Pistons. I'd like to thank us our sponsor for this week's episode. And that is bet online for my co-host Jasper Apollonia. I'm Mike Anguilano. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Network, and we will see you all next time.